recording. Welcome everybody to pre-health shadowing. My name is Nina and I am currently a second year undergraduate student at the University of California in Merced. I am also the co-founder and CEO of pre-health shadowing. Pre-health shadowing is an international student-led, woman-led, minority-led, nonprofit organization for medical advancement. Thank you guys all for joining me today. Just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. If you are looking for a mentor, Free Health Shadowing is holding a mentorship connection weekend. And this is actually coming up very soon, February 19 to 21. So if you guys are interested, now is the time to get in on this. There are a couple ways that you can get into this wonderful event. Uh, there is a raffle happening during this live session today. So you guys can get into this raffle. It's $3 donation uh, per raffle ticket. There's two methods of payment, PayPal and Venmo, and the winner will be announced at the end of the session today. So if you guys are interested in potentially finding a virtual mentor for life as we continue living through this ongoing global pandemic, I encourage you to check this out. We do have closed captioning to accommodate students of all abilities and needs. If you guys have any ideas about how we can be more accessible, feel free to email us at info at prehealthshadowing.com. Since pre-health shadowing has the ability to um, connect students from not only places in the US, but all over the world, uh, go ahead and drop in the chat where you guys are Zooming from today. It'd be awesome to know. Wonderful, welcome everyone. All right, awesome. All right, we can go ahead and move on. If you guys want to never miss a virtual shadowing session with Pre-Health Shadowing, we have uh, daily virtual shadowing sessions, Monday through Friday, up until June. So if you guys are interested in getting in those um, hours, listening to professionals from all over the world talk about their different specialties, their different paths, um, you can sign up for our email list um, and just put in your email. It's on our website. Once you do so, you're going to want to make sure that the pre-health shadowing goes to your inbox. This is a really big um, big life changer here because you might be getting the emails and it might be going to your junk, it might be going to your spam, it could be going to your promotions as well. And so just making sure that when you sign up for our email list, if you just type pre-health shadowing in the search bar, it'll pop up. You can mark our emails as important and that just ensures that it goes directly to the inbox where you can see it when you want to see it. You guys can also follow us on Instagram and TikTok at pre-health shadowing. Alrighty. We do have some wonderful opportunities. A perk of being a student with pre-health shadowing is that you get these pre-health shadowing perks. So we have partnered with Kaplan and if any of you guys are going to be taking any type of standardized test for a program, you can get free resources. These are free study guides for a bunch of classes that you guys might already be taking. Um, not only that, but you'll also get a 10% coupon code off of any Kaplan course. Um, and so this is a wonderful opportunity. You can check the link that someone just dropped into the chat right now. The second opportunity that we have to present to you today is the Fem Health Summit. And this is coming up at the end of this week as well. So if you guys are interested in getting a year long membership to hear insight from 19 very um, established women in healthcare, these are CEOs, leaders, business owners that are all um, healthcare leaders. And so if you guys are interested in learning from their journeys, um, getting inside uh, access to Fem Health resources, definitely check this out. We are having um, a discount code. Normally it is $49. It is $29 just for a couple more days. If you guys are interested, I highly encourage it. Life-changing. That's all I'm going to say. Alrighty. Thank you. You can go ahead and move on. If you aren't feeling the discount, we um, are doing a uh, Fem Health giveaway. And so yes, $29, but you can get it for free if you enter into our scholarship. So we have 15 scholarships to give away and we are giving away three different ways. The first way is to submit a 350 word or less essay about uh, answering these three questions down here. The second way is to submit a video that is two minutes or less answering those same three questions. The last way is a raffle, um, and we will be presenting that to you during our live sessions. So make sure to stay up with Free Health Shadowing, and you might have the opportunity to win a free year-long membership to Fem Health. We have partnered with the woman-led organization Mask for Mask, which for every four masks purchased, 
for masks will get donated to someone in need, whether this be um, a hospital that is lacking in resources or people in the homeless community or really just anyone who cannot provide for themselves during this ongoing global pandemic. They have a bunch of very cute designs um, and not only will you be supporting this great organization, you'll also be supporting pre-health shadowing to keep pre-health shadowing completely free and accessible to students around the world. You'll get 15% off of any of your orders with Mask for Mask by using the code PHS15 and you'll also be donating 10% of proceeds uh, to pre-health shadowing to help us fight inequity in health education. Pre-Health Shadowing is a student-based, student-led organization. If you guys are interested in joining us on our journey, you are more than welcome. We have both synchronous and hands-on opportunities. Um, prehealthshadowing.com. You can become a student volunteer. You can work either on your own schedule or get together with a group of students um, across the world to really um, start any project or initiative that you guys are interested in. You can also get a leadership role within Prehealth Shadowing by applying on our website, prehealthshadowing.com slash team member. If you are a high school student, we also have a high school program, HTP. You can apply on our website as you would for the pre-health shadowing team. And this will be working to establish pre-health shadowing as a club on various campuses around the US. If you are looking to get published, Pre-Health Shadowing has some opportunities for you. You can submit articles, reflections, reviews, and success stories to our website, prehealthshadowing.com slash blog submissions for the opportunity to be featured on our website. You can put this on your resume, your CVs, your applications, and your LinkedIn. Check it out if you're interested. All right, if you are financially able to donate, we do humbly ask you to uh, please help us provide for this organization. We are relying solely off of the donations and time of our volunteers. All of our students, all of our leadership are all volunteers, um, including myself. We are putting in lots of hours to make sure that we are um, making this opportunity as accessible and as flexible for our students as possible. If you guys are able to help us keep our website up, we have been uh, struggling keeping our website up. It has been crashing quite often due to the high influx of students. We are trying to provide for as many students as possible. And so we do humbly ask you um, to please either donate or share this link with someone who you believe will be able to donate. Thank you. Alrighty, throughout the duration of today's presentation, feel free to drop your questions in the chat and our co-hosts will be sure to ask them during the Q&A portion during the second half of today's virtual shadowing session. Remember to take good notes because each shadowing session will be followed by a post shadowing assessment that will be available at the end of the session, uh, which verifies your uh, virtual shadowing hours with a certificate. So we will be sending out all of the details at the end of today's virtual shadowing session. Be sure to take good notes. Uh, yeah, I could be. Okay. All right, okay, I'm good for. All righty, go ahead and move on. Um, we do invite you to turn your cameras on. Uh, we're trying to make this as close to a true shadowing experience as possible. We know it's not always possible, but if you are able to, please do so. It just makes it like we're more in a room together. All right, without further ado, I would like to welcome to you our professional for today. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Meredith. Thank you, thanks for having me. That uh, I admired what you did before, Nina, but now I'm, I, I really admire after that great introduction. You do a lot of work and it's pretty cool. And um, certainly at the start of my career in surgery, I never knew what it entailed or what that path would look like. So I think this is definitely worthwhile. So, um, Nina. Do you have my slides or am I supposed to share my own presentation? Sorry. Yes, if you're able to share your presentation, go ahead. We do have your slides. If you're unable, we can definitely do that. Yeah, okay. if you upload mine. Sorry, I thought you were going, to, I thought it was um, going to be uploaded through you. No worries. I can, I can share if you want me to, Nina. Thank you, Hannah. That'd be awesome. I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll for the students. Um, feel free to um, check this out. Do you know what you wish to pursue? Of course, it doesn't have to be definite. Things change. As long as you have an idea of where you're going. Doesn't- Yeah, things always change. 
<laughs> Wonderful. If you haven't yet submitted your uh, response and you'd like to, go ahead and do so. I can go ahead and share it so that everyone can take a look around the room. A little split. We have a lot of people who do have a plan, so wonderful. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and do our second in regards to today's virtual shadowing session. All right, if you have not yet submitted your vote and you would like to, go ahead. Hannah, were you able to get it up? Yeah, I have it. Just let me present it for a second. Wonderful, thank you. All right, couple more seconds and I'll be closing the poll. All righty. <laughs> we'll see by the end of this virtual shadowing session. Today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> keep going with these polling questions do you guys <laughs> i got it yep here we go uh share screen just two there we go all right everyone see it yes wonderful thank you hannah and uh i'm gonna go ahead and release uh the results to this last polling question regarding do you have a mentor yet and i see a lot of people are looking for one so uh, i have a great opportunity for you we do have a raffle happening right now uh, for our mentorship networking event there are other ways you can get involved there's a scholarship um, opportunity posted on our social media if you follow us on instagram you can see all the details you can get into our mentor networking event um, check it out if you guys are interested all right without further ado i would like to present to you Dr. Meredith, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks again for having me. I'm super excited to be here. I'm, um, uh, like I said before, I think it's quite an important uh, tool in your, in your path to decision making. And, and, and like Nina said before, that your decisions can change quite a lot over the next few years. And my name's Enika, and I practice in New Zealand. I'm, um, I was asked to speak about my path to oncoplastic breast surgery uh, and the things that I might see in a day. And in fact, I'm both a general surgeon, I'm general surgical trained and an oncoplastic breast surgeon. So I'm going to pay a little tribute to general surgery at the end there. Um, and actually what you say, uh, what you said, Nina, about finding a mentor, that's quite important. That's quite an interesting poll because I do highlight throughout this talk the importance of having a mentor. I think it's super important um, and something that I didn't do early on in my career. And actually, I don't know that I ever did. But first up, a disclaimer. Um, sorry, I can't. If somebody can move my slide. Next slide. Thank you. Um, the way I did it is not necessarily the right way, necessarily in brackets, but it's absolutely not the right way. Um, but actually, it's, I always say to my patients that you make the best decisions for you and for your life with the information that you have. And I think we can only do that. So you have to find the, the path that is the best for you. And that might not be a, a linear path. Um, and, you know, at this stage in your life, when you're building lives and relationships and having children, it, it can't be linear. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so first learning point, there are many ways to get there and you'll see that I had a very tangential path, but um, you know, I have no regrets and uh, it's just important to, to be resolute in, in your self-belief and your goals. Um, next slide, thank you. So we've done this. Um, we can move on with that one. So I'm afraid I can't speak to you about the path to surgery in New Zealand, in, the, in America. Um, I do know the path to surgery in New Zealand, Australia. And I think the main difference being, and you can flick me your messages through the chat, that the path to specialization is a lot quicker. I don't think you have so many junior general years, but I, I'm happy to be corrected. Somebody, somebody tell me if they know better. For an undergraduate medical student in New Zealand and Australia, we have six years. The first year being a general year of health sciences, a few thousand students who are doing a basic year of health sciences. And, and there's a variety of goals. It might be medicine, it will be dentistry, 
physiotherapy and uh, health sciences. And then at the end of the year, based on your grades, based on your preference, um, you'll move on to medicine or whatever allied health um, uh, preference you had. So following that, you do a house surgeon year for a couple of years, and these are junior doctor jobs. So you're on the ward, you're seeing patients, you're clerking patients, and you can do that for a couple of years doing internal medicine uh, and surgery, really just finding your feet and, uh, and deciding what you want to do. So at this point, there's no expectation that, that one will know where they'll end up in terms of specialization. After a couple of years of doing that, most people would do a couple of years, then you'll end up in a non-training registrar post. And a registrar, at that point, you kind of know what you want to do. So you're going to surgery or you're going into medicine or pathology and radiology or radiology. So you do a non-training job for another for two or three years, um, just kind of learning the ropes, working under senior registrars. And then you have your specialty training posts. So non-training registrar for two to three years, specialty training registrar for about five to six years, depending on the program. And then at the end of that, you're a consultant surgeon. So what's that? That's about 10-ish uh, years. Um, after, so for general surgery, for me, um, I completed my surgical training at the end of that specialty training registrar year. And then we embark on fellowship. And that's where you subspecialize even more. So my subspecialty training was in breast and oncoplastic breast, and that's for a couple of years. And then you can call yourself a specialist surgeon. So it's a, it's a long path. Uh, next slide, please. Um, my own path was uh, complicated. So I literally grew up in paradise. Uh, my parents are half Samoan and uh, between the age of 16, I grew up in Samoa, which is in Polynesia. And uh, it was cool, the weather's good, you're in sandals, it's good weather, it's good beaches, it's good food. Um, and then I went to, back to New Zealand to do university, it's the southernmost part of New Zealand in the South Island, so it's cold, it's cold. Um, and so I spent six years down here doing med school. And in the final year of medical school, I fell pregnant, which was, of course, a surprise and definitely not planned. And this was a challenge because um, this was 2003, so 17 years ago-ish. And, um, and I, I can't speak to the way it would be now, but certainly at that time, I wasn't allowed to have time off to have a child nor time for maternity leave. And um, I, uh, so I had to continue exams. In fact, I had an exam the day after I, I gave birth. And, uh, and, and so that was, that was my first hurdle. Regardless, I finished med school. Um, and then I spent a couple of years as a house surgeon. So a junior doctor working between medicine and surgery um, around New Zealand, between Auckland and Wellington. And then I really wasn't sure, even at that point, I, I wasn't sure what I was going to do, whether it was going to be medicine or surgery or radiology. And um, so I decided, next slide, thank you. That I would go to um, Australia and work up in the beaches of northern New South Wales, where the water was warm, where I could uh, surf, where I could have good food, where the weather was good. Um, and I did emergency medicine here for a couple of years, and that was, yeah, that was so nice. Um, that was that was fun. That was pretty cool. I thought maybe I could have a life doing emergency medicine. I enjoyed trauma, um, and certainly get a lot of trauma in these parts of Australia. Plus, we were seeing spider bites and um, snake bites, things we don't see in in New Zealand. And I'm not not quite sure where in the United States you'd see that. Um, but uh, next slide, thank you. I couldn't, um, in addition to that, you get a lot of the, the generic stuff. So you get a lot of the um, uh, ear pain, ear infections in the middle of the night and the ear infections in the middle of the night. And I couldn't, uh, I couldn't really, I, I couldn't really tolerate that. So I decided that I couldn't do um, emergency medicine. And I decided to try to um, try my hand at urology. 
So I flew back to New Zealand and uh, spent a couple of years doing urology. Next slide. Like that guy there. And uh, I bummed around doing that for a little bit, enjoyed it. But then I fell into general surgery. Next slide, thank you. And actually, I loved it. And part of, part of the attraction to a specialty um, is the other personalities that you come across. And for me, general surgery fit my personality. People were um, quite uh, outgoing. You see a lot of variety. You see a lot of very sick people. You see a lot of trauma. You see a lot of cancer. And then you can see a lot of minor stuff. You can see um, hemorrhoids, uh, simple lacerations. Um, but the variety is very stimulating and the surgery can be very um, gross. You're in, you know, you're in the abdomen, everything's open. Um, and so I enjoyed that. And I decided at that point, I would just, I would apply to general surgical training. Next, thank you. So five years after I graduated from medicine, I applied to general surgery and some would say that's a little late. I was... 27 28 at the time and and you know a lot of people have this goal like they want to finish surgical training before they turn 30 which fair enough if that's your goal but I don't think there is a huge rush because I think that every experience you have um, you can you can pull from it and it will it will build you but uh, so I, postgraduate year five I applied to general surgery started general surgery training did that for a couple of years next slide thanks and then I decided that I would, uh, I was tired of operating. I would try my hand at public health. I fell into a quite a good group um, who are internationally renowned for public health and their contribution to public health and their involvement with WHO. So that was quite fortuitous. And, um, and a lot of my colleagues and my, uh, my bosses at the time said to me, uh, it's the wrong thing to do, you're stupid. Um, you're going to de-skill, uh, you should be operating. So you're always going to have that over the course of your career, people telling you what you should and you shouldn't do. And I think you, you have to make the, de the decisions that are best for yourself. So, of course, the surgeon said, well, you can't do public health. Can you just um, advance, thanks? Can we go back? There's just a, there's just a, a picture missing. Can you, can you maybe tap it? Yeah, so this guy happened. <laughs> I don't know if anybody knows this guy. Type again, please, Anna. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so this is Atul Gawande, and I, I, I think he's wonderful, one of Time's most influential people a few years ago. If anyone doesn't know him, he uh, is a surgeon, general surgeon, public health expert. Yeah, yeah, his books are amazing. So somebody's just messaged, I uh, love his books. And I, I think his books um, are really important uh, because they speak a lot to the humanity in the job, um, which I think lacks a lot in, the, in some of the, the surgical um, memoirs. Uh, and so he happened a few years after I did public health. So I was pretty happy about that. Next slide, thank you. Um, but in my year doing public health, I was able to work with national data sets. We were dealing with huge um, census data, and I was able to do my own um, statistical analyses on it. I authored three international publications in um, cancer epidemiology journals. I presented to a WHO panel, and I'm um, subsequently part of a Lancet Oncology International Collaborative with a goal to improve cancer services and um, disparities in small island nations. And... So I really was able to gain a lot in this year. Uh, and I think that's really important. Wherever you go, whatever you, you're doing, wherever you're posted, you know, we don't, we don't always get the best jobs or you don't always have the best attachments or rotations. You're always able to take something positive out of it. Um, and uh, even if it's how not to do something. And so I always think it's just important to, to, pull, to pull something to learn, to take something from, from everything that we're doing. Next slide, thanks. Um, so I did one year of that and then I came back to general surgery to finish general surgery. So my challenges in surgical training, um, it's a consuming uh, specialty. 
and particularly for training. And that's warranted because at the end of the day, we're making decisions that affect people's lives and impact people's lives. So it is an apprenticeship that requires hours on the floor. Um, and uh, But it is consuming at a moment in time where you're trying to have a family, where you're trying to um, build relationships and, uh, and to have children. One of my biggest um, challenges was the lack of a female role model. Um, throughout my surgical training, I, uh, there were only two other female surgeons within the region, and in fact, in, in New Zealand, who uh, were prominent in council, and neither of them had children. They were very strong, they were very, um, very brave, you know, they were great role models for the purpose of being a woman surgeon but actually the I found it difficult because they didn't have children so they didn't understand that aspect to trying to be a woman in surgery or trying to have a family as a woman in surgery it's a very prescriptive nature in New Zealand you still struggle to have time training um, and of course it's a it's a huge challenge to raising a family um, advance thank you so my learning points are feel free to explore. I, I always think you should feel free to explore and not be limited by the frame, but you have to be sure that you don't burn your bridges and that you've got a parachute and it's a two-way street. You don't want to, you don't want to burn your bridges and not be able to come back. Um, next learning points, training programs are tough. And I don't think that a training program necessarily should deter you. There are a lot of uh, people who choose not to train in surgery because the training is, is, is tough. And I think no matter what training program you choose, it's going to be difficult. But it's really important to find a mentor and find a role model. Find somebody who knows you, find somebody who champions you and who can be that stability for you over this time. I think that's really important. So I finished my surgical training. That was in 2014. Um, I was a consultant looking for a subspecialty to do. And I thought that perhaps I would like to do bariatrics or obesity surgery. And I spent 12 months doing um, uh, upskilling and laparoscopic bypass work and uh, flew to Montreal to present and to um, San Francisco for the American meeting. And I fell into one of the section meetings and this is this is what it looked like. Of course, it didn't literally look like this, but I'll let you take what you want from it. For me, it was like this. It was a bit, a bit gray. It didn't really fit me from a personality point of view. And this is what I mean. Often we're, we're dictated by the personalities we meet and we bounce off. And this is how most of us, I think, fall into our, fall into our specialties. And then I stumbled into a breast um, session at the same meeting in San Francisco and there was a very good speaker from MSK and uh, I've literally just googled happy conference here but it looked like this people were happy it was a lot of um it was very innovative very dynamic and um, oncoplastic surgery at that time was very very new in New Zealand and Australia and I think even newer in the USA and it's a very young specialty. Um, so I decided I'd embark on an oncoplastic breast fellowship. And I did uh, my training in Auckland and Sydney and then spent some time throughout the UK and Europe because it's important in your subspecialty training to be in centers that are high volume, seeing things over and over again, looking at how things can go wrong um, and how to, how to manage that. Next slide. And for me, the challenge to taking up oncoplastic breast at that moment when I was a qualified general surgeon was that it was a relatively new specialty at the time in New Zealand and Australia, trying to get the volume um, of practice and, and the cases to be good and to be better. And for me, there are a few transferable skills from general surgery to breast reconstruction. Being in the abdomen is very, very different from trying to reconstruct a breast or doing implant or flat work. So it was a period of very rapid acquisition of new skills, which was, which was a challenge at a moment when I should have been quite proficient at, um, at operating. Um, so now I'm going to just give you a little bit of background to breast cancer. I'm trying to mix up with a bit of clinical stuff so um, we can see if we can convince anybody to do breast. 
Um, but the first description of breast cancer, and this is this is what I this is what I give to my medical students. And the first description of breast cancer was in 2500 BC, of course, written on Egyptian papyrus paper and described at that time as being um, a bulging mass in the breast, cool, with no fever and spreads into the skin. This is how I would expect a breast, uh, sorry, a medical student to describe a breast lump to me or breast cancer. And at that time, the therapy was, was none. There was, uh, there was no known therapy at that time. Thank you advance. Um, and then some years later, the first documentation for treatment uh, was Queen Atossa of Persia, who, historic, who famously kept herself swathed in a, in a white sheet or a few white sheets. She noticed a bleeding lump from, from the breast and persuaded, um, was persuaded by her slave to allow him to excise it with a knife, uh, which doesn't differ terribly from the way we would treat a breast cancer now. Uh, uh, we have two options for managing a breast cancer. One is a surgical, so I'm just talking about surgery. Uh, one is to do a mastectomy, which is removal of the entire breast. And the other is to do a lumpectomy, so removal of just the lump. Advance, thank you. So William Halstead, who um, was an American surgeon, and if you do general surgery or spent time in surgical wards, you will know his name. Um, he was a general surgeon, uh, famous for the radical mastectomy, in fact, is interchangeable. His name is interchangeable with the concept of a, of a radical mastectomy, but I think he was well known for his hernial repair work as well. Um, and the radical mastectomy started sometime in the late 1800s to the early and continued to the early 1900s. He trained and popularized the radical resection of the chest wall in a woman with breast cancer. So excised her breast, her her rib cage, her the pectoralis major muscle, the collarbone, the, the, the shoulder, the lymph nodes in the neck. Um, and so women were remarkably disfigured and uh, not able to have shoulder function. Uh, can we go on? Thank you, Lance. Um, so often they were left like this, so deformed. Uh, you can see there's that right shoulder is uh, not very functional. Um, but at the time, it was the only known treatment. And of course, he was a force and he trained hundreds of surgeons and tens of thousands of women had this treatment. So women didn't want to be spared the knife thinking that this was their only way to survive. What he didn't understand was at the time, he thought he could do more aggressive surgery to prevent recurrence. But even though he was doing massively aggressive surgery, women were still, recur were still recurring. Knowing this, a few other surgeons at this moment, I think it was early 1900s, started to do simple lumpectomies, so just removing the lump and giving radiotherapy to the breast because they understood that actually breast cancer was a systemic problem and doing hugely disfiguring surgery wasn't, wasn't to their benefit. But of course, they were fighting a force and they were fighting the norm at the time. And women didn't want to be spared the knife because they thought this was their chance to cure. Um, advance, thank you. And then this happened. Um, does anybody know what this is? Quick flick of quick, quick uh, message. No. This is thalidomide. And this happened. <laughs> Invitation. Um, this is thalidomide. Uh, so this happened in about the 1950s, 1960s, and it was, um, I think, manufactured in Germany as a, a sedative or tranquilizer, but a lot of women were, started using it. It started to be prescribed for women who were um, pregnant for morning. Like Dr. Meredith. Alrighty, everybody. Um, so while our speaker uh, 
becomes unfrozen, we can just go ahead and um, remind you all that we currently have a raffle happening. If anybody is interested in getting a mentor, a virtual mentor, potentially for life that will help you through the COVID-19 pandemic application cycle, who will give you insight into their various careers. They could be someone that you are shadowing. Um, thank you, Hannah. Just drop the link in the chat if you guys are interested. Um, so oh, let me go ahead and turn my camera back on. <laughs> so if you guys are interested, you guys can send us a Venmo or a PayPal. Please let me know if you're having any issues. I did hear that Venmo might have been giving people some problems. If you do have any issues, uh, please contact us. You can email us at info at prehealthshadowing.com or you can also uh, DM uh, any of the team members in the chat and we can help you with that. Um, does anybody have any questions? All right, whenever you're ready. Yeah, let's go. Okay, cool. So um, this happened, thalidomide happened. Um, next slide, thank you. People started to question or they felt empowered to question medical professionals because it was so obvious that they had 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 hidden best treatment and hidden hidden the fact that thalidomide was 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 damaging for um, for women and for, for, for women who are pregnant. And then uh, Dr. Bernard Fisher, who some of you may or may not know, I think he died a year ago or a couple of years ago at the age of 100, 101. He founded the um, NSABP. And, uh, and this is what I love about breast cancer. And, and um, yeah, well, breast cancer has a huge body of research behind it, actually. It's one of the most intelligent cancers, I think. There's a huge body of evidence that drives our practice. And he was instrumental in this. So he famously said that no clinical therapy should be determined by emotion or conviction and this is the way we practice now this everything that we do has to have an evidence base behind it we can't do something just because we think it's the right way to it's the right thing to do i'm talking about clinically everything has to have has we have to have evidence that it doesn't harm and it improves somebody's life um, and breast cancer so it's a huge body of literature behind it in that regard. Uh, next slide, thank you. So he uh, was instrumental in, in one of the trials that looked at comparing those women who had uh, been treated with a radical mastectomy versus women who were treated with a simple lumpectomy and radi radiation therapy. So I always say to my patients when a woman comes into clinic with a breast cancer, and of course they're worried that they're going to, um, that they want to do the best they can possibly do to survive their breast cancer, that there's no difference in survival. We take a hundred women who have a breast cancer on one side who have a mastectomy, meaning remove their entire breast. We take a hundred women in another group who have a lumpectomy with radiation therapy. We follow those women for 20, 30 years. There's no difference in survival. And we have tens of thousands of patients now who have, who, who have been in randomized controlled trials. So we, we have that body of evidence behind us to tell us it's safe. And next slide, thank you. And that's just to demonstrate that there is no just, um, sorry, difference in survival. Next slide, thank you. So um, then, uh, so oncoplastic breast surgery, uh, what is oncoplastic breast surgery? Well, it's breast conservation uh, in the setting of incorporation of plas plastic surgical techniques to restore breast shape and symmetry. Um, and really it came about because of women like this. 30% uh, of women who have a simple lumpectomy have a result that's not desirable. And many times these women, they can spend years like this feeling guilty that they're not happy about the way they look in the mirror because they feel like they should just be grateful that they survived. And, um, sorry, next slide. Thank you. Um, but now we know that with improvements, breast cancer is such a survivable disease now. We know that with a breast screening program, we're achieving cure and up to 90% of patients even more. So the goal is twofold for me. Number one, it's to excise the breast cancer and get cancer control. And number two, to restore them so that their shape and symmetry is normal, is acceptable so that they can do their normal daily activities, so that they can go to the pool, so that they can look in the mirror and feel confident because those are major 
um, major um, uh, indicators for quality of life after cancer treatment. Next slide, thank you. We know also psychologically that women will do better if we keep their breast because they, it's always difficult to reconstruct a breast which is which has the same, same sensation, which looks and feels like a normal breast. So I always say if we can keep the breast, then we should. Next slide, thank you. When I see a woman in clinic, I there are many considerations. And number one, the tumor. Number one, her. Um, what does she look like? Does she have any other medical problems? What's her family history? What size is her cancer relative to her breast? Is she going to have chemotherapy? What do the oncologists want to do? Is she going to have radiation therapy? Is she going to have reconstruction if, and the timing of that? How are we going to time it? And what does she want? So all of these things I'm thinking when I'm seeing a woman in the clinic. The beginning of oncoplastic breast surgery looked something like this. So we have zones in the breast which are predictable for their um, risk of deformity after treatment so in certain zones of the breast like this area here just under the nipple and in the upper pole of the breast and in that cleavage area we know if we're going to take a large volume of tissue here and they go on to have radiation therapy they have very predictable deformities so this is called a bird beak deformity uh, and this woman came to me a few years ago. She um, had uh, had her cancer excised. It was a good cancer. So, you know, cancers can be, can be on a spectrum, but she was cured. Um, and she was a professor. She was supposed to be getting married, but she wasn't confident. She, of course, but you can see why. Um, she wasn't going to the pool anymore. She used to like to swim every day, but she was conscious about the way she looked in the, in the swimming costume. So sure, she's cured, but it's had a major impact on her quality of life and her ability to return to normal. Um, thank you. So uh, then um, some clever French surgeons identified that Actually, if it was predictable, then perhaps we could make it better in one go and incorporated the use of a breast reduction after resection of that cancer. And if you go to the next slide, thank you. Because when we do breast reductions, the area of the breast that we resect is standard. It looks like that. Can, I, can you see the arrow if I'm moving the arrow around or no? No, okay. Yeah. So it's the, the dark pink, it's the dark pink area. Yeah, everything below there. Yeah, thank you for doing that. And that's stuff that we're going to remove standardly in a breast reduction. And if she has the cancer at six o'clock, which is just underneath the nipple, then we can incorporate the resection of that breast cancer. Thank you. And resection of that breast cancer in the reduction technique, which is pretty clever. So we can reshape her, we can remodel her, we can avoid a deformity. And she's happy she can go to the pool. Next slide, thank you. And so this is what it looks like in surgery, which is always alarming for a medical student when they come into theatre because everything is splayed open. You think it's never going to come together and look normal again. And thank you. Go on to the next slide. All right. And then next slide, thank you. So just that's what it looks like in theatre. That's what we call a volume displacement technique. And that's what I do a lot of in my own practice in, in New Zealand. Uh, next slide. I'm going to quickly show you some cases. So um, this is a woman on the right there. You can see the bruise in the upper pole on the right. Uh, sorry. So look, sorry, the other, other right. <laughs> uh, sorry, her right. <laughs> the other picture <laughs> where the bruise is. Yeah, exactly. That one. Thank you. Um, so she had a, a big area of pre-cancer change. And uh, uh, I think it was 10 centimeters, which is pretty big. Um, she was fit and active and she didn't want a mastectomy and of course you think you look at a, mas a mastectomy in this woman and she's going to be very discrepant because she's got a very large breast on the other side and you can imagine that a reconstruction is going to be very difficult because we're trying to make a big breast plus she's got the volume to move she's got large breasts and uh, so this is what she looked like afterwards and often these women are, for them it's a silver lining because they may have wanted a reduction before um, and certainly they're pretty happy to have a reduction now. 
in addition to having their cancer treated. Thank you, next slide. Same again. So you can see we can use that reduction pattern quite nicely. And um, restoring shape, symmetry, trying to reduce deformity, trying to improve her quality of life after surgery. Um, and this is another example of a woman who actually wanted a breast reduction for a long time. And just because of the way the health system works in New Zealand, she wasn't eligible for that in the public setting. Um, so she, had, she presented with a cancer on that right side. Perfect lady to have a breast reduction. She's got very large breasts. It was, um, she had to custom make her bras. She had indentation in her shoulders. She had chronic neck, shoulder, back pain, headaches, all those classic things that women with large breasts come to us complaining of when they were seeking breast reduction surgery. Uh, next slide. So she um, went on to have a, a, a breast reduction both sides. Um, the nipple had to go on her right side because the cancer was sitting right on it, but we removed two kilos from each side. So she's four kilos lighter at the end of the day. Next slide, thank you. Same again. Really just demonstrating how much we're able to do. Um, you know, historically, a lot of these women, they've got very large areas of disease. And historically, that would have been treated with a mastectomy. If you look at their other side, they're going to be left either incredibly discrepant or they're going to be tough to reconstruct because reconstruction is, is, is tough, particularly for these women who are larger. Next slide, uh, we can skip this. So what about the women that don't have the ability to move tissue for displacement? They're not, they don't, they're not D, E, F, cup breasts, they're C, B. Um, well, we can replace volume from the chest wall from the side. It's an example of a woman who had um, a breast cancer, seven, eight centimeters, so quite big uh, in the left breast in the upper outer quadrant, which is where about 40, 50, thank you for, for moving the arrow around, super. Um, in the upper outer quadrant, which is where about 40% plus of breast cancers are found. And so she presented with that cancer. Actually, she, uh, if you look at that, looking at, the volume of tissue we have to remove relative to the size of her breast, she looks like she's going to be a mastectomy. We can't remove that much tissue and leave a breast that looks behind that is normal. And if we think about trying to reduce her, she's gonna end up too small for size. So she went on to have chemotherapy because she had a tumor which was sensitive to chemotherapy. And um, you can see the density at the top of the screen there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, usually we'd have both sides to compare it with, which would tell us actually this density is something different. Uh, she actually had an ultrasound mass and MRI mass as well, but she had seven, eight centimeters of change. She went on to have chemotherapy and the next slide. And you can see that density has, has dissolved it's disappeared the clips in the middle there are where we put the clips for biopsy at the time of biopsy so that in the event the cancer disappears we can find it but you can see she's had a very good result and this is what i mean about the approach to the patient who's in front of me in clinic is she going to have chemotherapy um uh, should we give it first should we give it later this is an example of where i gave it first to try to reduce the size of that cancer so that my surgery was going to be better and safer for her um, next slide. So this is volume replacement. Um, she didn't want a mastectomy, fair enough. She was young, pretty fit and active, wanted to look as normal as possible. We take tissue from the side of the chest wall where you have a roll. Most of us have a little roll there, sits in the bra. And uh, we can remove, we can swing the tissue from that side there and slip it into the, that part of the breast. So um, you can see this is her, her on the... Uh, Yep, exactly. That's the tissue. And then post-operatively, you can see she's got a drain there. She's a bit bruised, but her shape looks good. And, uh, and she's matched for volume. She's a little bit bigger, but that will, that will reduce in size because, of course, she's going to have a bit of swelling. Next slide. Thank you. So these are what we call perforator flaps. Next slide. Thanks. Um, we have uh, the woman on the side. We've marked her out before, um, before surgery. Those little markings with the crosses are where we can hear our blood vessels with, an ultra, with, a, with a Doppler. 
Her cancer again was in the upper outer quadrant of the breast, quite high there. Um, next slide. And this is what she looks like after. So you can see that one advantage of this approach is that, um, one advantage of this approach, I've just been distracted by one of the expressions. Uh, one advantage of this approach is um, that she doesn't have any scars on the other side. We're not touching a healthy breast, so she doesn't have the risk of wound complications on the other side. But she is bruised, on, uh, you can see she's bruised, but she's good, well matched for, for shape and for, and for volume. Next slide, thank you. And this is just to show the way the flap looks, that little um, po um, uh, package of tissue looks um, some weeks after uh, we put we swing that tissue and you can see it incorporates very nicely into her native breast. So it's a really good result. Obviously, this was not a good result because she's ended up with a mastectomy, but the tissue incorporates very nicely into her, into her native breast. Um, same again, so long scar on the side, but women don't complain about it. In my experience, it's a very long scar, but, um, but it's hidden in the brow line. And uh, to look at the breast, you don't see the scars. Thank you, next slide, same again. Um, uh, thank you, we can just uh, um, push on with these. I know we're, we're pushing for time. Um, and again, thank you, we can move on. So you can see we're really able to achieve a lot. Remember I said that the majority of breast cancers are found in the upper outer quadrant of the breast and this, this um, package of tissue and swinging it into the breast is perfect for those cancers if we require it. Next slide, thank you. Keep going. And um, so the other type of recon I would do is a LD reconstruction, so latissimus dorsi reconstruction. So that's a muscle that's in the back. Um, and uh, I swing the muscle from the back to the um, anterior chest wall to reconstruct the breast, usually with in conjunction with an implant. Um, I quite like this reconstruction. It looks, it ages well, it, it looks good, but of course you've always got to consider that everything we do to another part of the body has a, has a price to pay for her. So of course we need to do a mastectomy in the chest, but she's going to pay the price of a wound in the back. Um, and this is just some examples of, uh, of the LD reconstruction. The woman, this woman here, obviously she's had a left mastectomy. She had what we call a multifocal cancer. So she had um, four or five foci of cancer in the left breast, including where she's got that scar over her breastbone. Um, and the, unfortunately the skin was involved there, so we need to take, take the skin and the nipple was involved, so we needed to take the nipple. But her shape and symmetry is pretty good. Goals always to match the, the cleavage because of course this is what she's going to look at when she's wearing her tops, when she's looking down. Um, and then, so her next, um, her next step is to have a nipple and, and she didn't want a nipple done, so she's pretty happy. She just wants to go look good in a bra. Uh, same again, we can push on with this a woman who's had an, who's, uh, who's an LD reconstruction. And then we can use an LD a lot for women who've had a mastectomy in the past um, and they require fresh tissue to the chest wall to reconstruct the breast over an implant. Um, I, I really like, like this LD flat. We can use it for a lot of reasons. And I, as part of my um, general surgical work, I work with the cardiothoracic surgeons to do some of their um, chest wall reconstructions after sarcomas. So an LD is quite a good um, flat for that. That's quite cool. I enjoy that part of that part of the job. This woman presented with a breast cancer there in between her breasts and her GP, her primary practitioner had been treating it for a couple of years, thinking it was a simple rash, and which probably was reasonable when it started. But of course, then it became quite solid and um, biopsy demonstrated this to be a breast cancer. In fact, um, it was stuck to her breast bone. So it wasn't resectable at the time that I saw her. So we tried to put her on some chemotherapy to reduce the size and maybe make it a bit easier to operate but unfortunately that didn't happen and six months later she still had a tumor which looked exactly the same and it was very fixed so we decided because there was no disease anywhere else to resect her breast bone and I did this in conjunction with the, one of the cardiothoracic surgeons so he took her breast bone 
and um, we took it on block with the cancer and he filled it with um, mesh and some cement. And then I put a flap over the top of that. And that's how she looks now. Cool, thank you. Implant reconstruction. So most of us who do reconstruction mostly do implant reconstruction unless you're purely flap. Um, certainly in the States, I think the large majority of breast reconstruction is implant and prosthetic based. You'll have uh, plastic surgeons and different reconstruction, re reconstructive surgeons tell you about implant placement and where they, what they do and where they put it. My personal practice is I put it underneath the muscle, which is exactly as you see here. And I put, and I use a mesh, and um, which is the matrix on the lower pole that you can see there. I won't go much into that, suffice to say. I have a lot of implant reconstruction in my practice. Thank you. And um, so they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, of course, we use it for reconstruction. We use it for augmentation. They can be smooth. They can be, um, oh my God, the words just escaped me now. Um, Non-smooth. Somebody can send me the, the, the word if they, if they have it at the tip of their tongue. Um, next slide. Yes, so of course, patients can be very um, anxious. They need a lot of work up in their, uh, a lot of time, a lot of work up in their, um, in their consultations. <laughs> Rough. Um, and it will come to me, it will come to me. Silicone versus saline, patients are worried that they're going to, that they might rupture. Uh, breast implant companies always tell us that if a bus runs over the implant, the implant will be just fine, which is funny because the patient won't be fine if she's run over by a bus, but apparently the implant will be. Um, there's a lot in the media right now about breast implanted, uh, sorry, breast implant associated illness and breast implant associated lymphoma. And of course, a lot of war women are worried that, that it may need to be revised in the lifetime. Um, so that's another 30 minute, 60 minute consult. Uh, this is an example of how um, we might use implants. So this woman had a mastectomy on the right, you can see, and was referred to me for reconstruction. So she's had an implant reconstruction on the right in a delayed fashion. And actually she had a family history. So she's had a left mastectomy, left nipple sparing mastectomy with direct to implant reconstruction there on the left as well. The scars hidden in the fold underneath the bra, bra line. Same again. So um, direct to implant reconstruction for this lady on, uh, in her right breast after she's had chemotherapy, a little full and swollen. This is early post-operatively. We can keep flicking through these. I think these are just images of of implants. Thank you. Flick again. Um, and then just as an example, when we're considering women for reconstruction, for any type of reconstruction, we also have to consider her other side because, of course, you want to match her as best as possible. Remember, the goal is to restore shape and, and symmetry, and symmetry is very important. So for a woman like this, who whose only option is to have an implant because she's got no tissue anywhere else, um, Sorry, if you can go back. Then um, we have to consider that she needs some form of symmetrization on the other side. So she needs, this woman needs an implant. And quite often we're doing a lot of symmetrization work in the other breast uh, for these women who are having reconstruction um, advance. Thank you. This woman, she needed her nipple removed because the cancer had come through to the nipple and, um, and she had a small augment on that left side. Same again, um, direct to implant reconstruction, we can advance with this. And again. Um, so this just to show you, this is a young woman who had, um, who presented with a mass on the right breast. And uh, she was young, she's in her thirties. She went on to have a mammogram so if we can flick through to the next slide, thank you. You can see in that right breast that she's got a diffuse area of microcalcification. This is what the radiologists are looking at when they're looking at mammograms. You can see the, the calcification there on that right side, which is absent on the left. Um, and it's 
what we call pleomorphic, so it's irregular, and the, it's widespread, she's in her 30s, we don't expect to see that. Um, and in fact, this was biopsy proven, uh, what we call high grade DCI, so pre-cancer change. You can see that the calcification comes right to the nipple, um, which meant that the nipple had to be removed at the same time. She needed a mastectomy here, no doubt, because there's no way we could remove all of that tissue safely and leave a, a breast that look, looks normal behind, plus having that extent of calcification and uh, probably means that breast is not healthy to keep anyway. Thank you. Next slide. So the nipple needed to go, like I said, she's had a direct implant reconstruction on the right. And actually she, we found a cancer on the left on an MRI and she needed, she want, elected for a, um, an implant reconstruction on the left side as well. Thank you. So the fat grafting, um, I do quite a lot of really harvesting fat from, uh, from anywhere a woman might have a fat, be it on the hips, on the thighs, on the buttocks. Thank you, just um, if we can move on. Uh, da, da, da. And again, so this, this is what it looks like. We're harvesting fat and then we're re-injecting it. Most of the time I would use it to resurface over an implant to improve the way an implant looks after a reconstruction that comes some months down the line. So I always tell a woman that reconstruction is never one operation. It's usually multiple. The first operation is the biggest operation. And then, of course, she needs two or three smaller procedures. Thank you. We can advance. Um, so just demonstrating that um, where we can use it in women who, who've had lumpectomies and require some volume replacement just to improve their um, uh, cosmesis. You can see that she's had some lipofilling over the the surface of the implant there on the left. Actually, we've done the same on the right, and, but usually it has to be some months later. So oncoplastic breast surgery, the advantages for, for me, um, I think breast cancer is very intelligent. I think it's one of the most intelligent tumor streams. Um, there's a huge body of evidence behind it, like I said, which really influences our practice. So everything we're doing is, is evidence-based and I think, and from a genomics and individualized medicine point of view, which is where the world is heading, then definitely breast cancer is at the forefront of that. Incorporation of reconstruction to the treatment pathway just adds another dimension uh, of treatment and consideration, which which is a challenge and which can be, um, which can be good. And and the lifestyle is good for me as a general surgeon doing general surgery seven day call. Definitely, oncoplastic breast surgery has a better lifestyle than that. Um, and the disadvantage for me was as a general surgeon, I was dealing more and more with breast surgery and doing much less general, which means you're not in the abdomen as much as you would have normally been had I done a specialty inside the abdomen. And uh, next slide. And um, so of course, actually 50% of my public practice is in general surgery. I spent a lot of time doing general, doing acute call, emergency call. And um, I find it very rewarding specialty. There's a huge diversity. There's huge diagnostic workup that you're involved in. And there's very integrated um, work with ICU, that's the intensive care, theaters, radiology, and for very critically unwell patients. Um, and I'm just gonna give you a, an illustration of a day on call. Um, so you can see here that there's something in that X-ray that shouldn't be there. And, that this guy probably came in overnight most of the time they're men I, I have to say i've never had a woman come in with something like that um but it, you know they, they come in overnight normally uh, and you can see that there's um uh probably a beer bottle uh in his rectum so that's usually what would be first on our list after a good weekend next slide and then sometime in the morning, um, we have somebody who comes in with severe abdominal pain and they've got, um, they need an emergency operation because they've got dead gut. And you can see this is small bowel and the small bowel is um, looking a bit, uh, well, looking very unhappy, potentially salvageable down here in the left um, corner. Yep, but probably dead up there on the right. 
So this is usually a small bowel resection and an anastomosis or a join. And then um, if, if they're elderly, if they're unwell, then they might need to spend some time in the intensive care unit. Next slide. Um, and then uh, lunchtime special, somebody who's had severe upper abdominal pain, maybe he's been taking um, an anti-inflammatory for a few days because he's got hip pain. That's free air under the diaphragm. So can you um, point out the diaphragm there? So go up those kind of hemi circles on each side of the chest, exactly. So you shouldn't see that lucency below the diaphragm, that's air that you can see, look at the lungs above, above there, which are full of air, they're quite, they're, they're lucent. Um, and you shouldn't see that degree of lucency below the diaphragm. So that means there's air underneath the diaphragm where it shouldn't be. And um, so something's perforated. Usually it's an ulcer, it might be the colon, might be the small bowel. And so that's a, an, an immediate category one for theater. Next slide. And then somewhere in the midst of that cool week or that cool day, we might have an obstructing colon cancer who comes in or a bleeding colon cancer that needs an emergency operation for a colectomy. So it's a pretty cool specialty. It's pretty busy, um, but very rewarding. Next slide. So my key messages are choose your own path. Um, I definitely had a tangential path, but it's really important to, to, to feel free to explore, take or learn from every experience you have, even if it's not a good one. Training programs are difficult no matter what you choose to do. And I don't think it should deter you from doing surgery because I think you can choose radiology or you can do, choose pathology. The training program is difficult no matter what you choose. Find a mentor, a role model, a champion. I think that's really important. And um, somebody who knows you, somebody who supports you and with, with whom you have a, you know, a, a good relationship who you can trust um, and explore but always have a parachute so always make sure that you can um, that you don't burn your bridges and it's a two-way street and I think that's me next slide thank you thanks for listening thank you so much Dr. Meredith uh, this is a wonderful presentation with very lovely uh, <laughs> uh, visuals as well to help us get uh, a sense of what you do every day um, so we do have a lot of questions in the chat, so we'll get right into it. I'll also offer that if anybody wants to come off mic and ask the question directly, uh, please raise your hand using the Zoom feature and we can help facilitate that. Um, so one of the first questions that we got uh, was how, until what age can a surgeon continue doing surgeries? So what, what age do you picture yourself stopping surgery? What age do I expect to stop surgery? <laughs> Me? Um, I think that's, you know, I think that's, that's debatable. Um, in New Zealand and Australia, and I think, I'm not sure about the UK, I think France, I'm actually in Paris, it's one thing, it's like 2.30 here in the morning. Um, I don't think there's any legislation for a surgeon retiring. I think you have to be safe to practice. In New Zealand, they, um, they try to get you off the call roster, um, I think probably from the age of about, of about 60 or 65, um, because, you know, when you're sick, well, hell, when you're 55, 60, you don't want to be doing 24 seven general surgery call. It's very, very busy. So they try to take you off the general call roster. Um, but I think you just have to be, you have to be safe to practice and you have to have that insight. But I don't think there's any mandate for, for age or legislation that governs when a surgeon um, should retire. Um, certainly not in New Zealand or Australia. I don't think in France. I really don't think the UK. I'm not sure about the States. But thank I'm you. well off retiring. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, Karishma, if you would like to go ahead and ask your question. Hello, Dr. Meredith. My name is Karishma. And I just had a question, and that is, what is the most common type of surgery or procedure performed in patients with breast cancer? Uh, the most common would be a simple lumpectomy. Thank you. Um, I will add to that, that it's a simple lumpectomy in New Zealand, in Australia, in the UK, and in Europe, but I'm not sure about the States. Thank you. Um... The question we had was, how well do the scars normally heal in the breast area? 
Um, the I saw that come through when I was doing the reduction um, reduction talk. Um, they heal very they heal very well. Um, the side that gets the radiation always looks better than the benign side. Of course, there's always a risk that wounds don't heal the way we imagine. Most of them heal well, but there's always a risk, and usually it's predictable. And 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 women who have obesity or who have diabetes or who have other medical problems that make for whom it is predictable you're going to have a wound problem most of the time they heal fine the scars look better on the side that's had radiation relative to the side that has not so i would always tell a woman that the side that doesn't get radiation her scars will be more prominent on the side but the scars are in the um hidden in the bra so and then have a terribly bothered by them thank you kind of to add on to that um, do, does having multiple surgical procedures on the breast, how does that impact the patient's potential to have a reconstructive surgery if they've had reoccurring cancer and issues in the area? So I'm just going to repeat that because I'm not quite sure I got it, but you are questioning her ability to have a reconstruction if she has multiple resections? Multiple yes, cancer multiple, resections? Yeah, yeah. Most of the time, if a woman is, has a recurrent cancer, because she's had radiation therapy, often it means that she can't have radiation therapy again. So in those women who have had radiation therapy prior, who are fit and well and young, um, they would be recommended for a mastectomy and a reconstruction at that moment in time. So you don't often have the situation where you have a woman who's had multiple cancer resections or multiple procedures for a cancer resection. Are you talking about for the same cancer or she's got multiple recurrences of cancer? Um, multiple recurrences of cancer. Yeah, no. Most of the time, if she's, had, if, if, she's, if she's had a recurrence and she's been treated with radiation and a lumpectomy, then most surgeons at that moment, if it was appropriate, would be offering a mastectomy with reconstruction. And that shouldn't re impact on her reconstruction. Of course, you have to take it into a consideration and offer a reconstruction which is safe and appropriate for having had that treatment, but it doesn't preclude her from having from being offered a reconstruction. Um, we have Ryan who has their hand raised. If you want to come on mic and ask your question. Uh, yes. So I was just wondering from your journey starting off with emergency medicine, going to neurology, and then finally landing where you are now. Um, would you say that you've had a lot of self-doubt or uncertainty about where you wanted to go in life? Um, I wouldn't call it self-doubt, but yes. Um, I've had a lot of uncertainty about, about what, where I would end up in, in, in my practice and what I would specialize in. And to a degree, I think I've fallen into things rather than having a, had a plan at the outset, for sure. All right, thank you. Bohar, if you wanna ask your question. Um, thank you for your talk. I was wondering why um, you mentioned that uh, implants can often lead to lymphomas in some patients, and that was like a concern that was uh, recent. Uh, why is that? Why would an implant uh, cause a lymphoma? I didn't. I didn't say often. I did say. I did say it. I didn't say often because it's definitely not something that happens frequently. But in the media of late, and particularly in the states, and I think even I think one of your implant companies. Um, don't produce implants anymore. Not, I, have to, I have to double check that. And it became apparent that for certain, for women who had um, reconstruction with certain types of implants, that they were risk, at risk of developing implant associated lymphoma. That risk is still incredibly, incredibly small. And so for the implants that I use, that risk is about one in 50,000. Um, you still have a higher risk of being hit by a car or walking across the street and by being and a high risk of being struck by lightning than developing an implant associated lymphoma. 
but there are, um, <laughs> he's apologizing, don't worry. Um, but there are, um, there are, there were certain other implants which had a higher risk for developing lymphoma, which was significant. And those are not being made anymore. And so, but we have to have that discussion with women because of course, if it's in, if it's in the media and they can read it, then, then, um, then we have to have that discourse. The risk is very, 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 very small. Thanks for answering that and clarifying. Uh, I'll ask one more question from the chat before we get back to the raised hands. Um, a lot of the pictures that you showed um, were breast cancers found in the upper quad outer quadrant. Is there a reason that most breast cancers are found there? It's probably to do with the density of the breast tissue and the, and the fact that most of the breast tissue in that area is dense. Yeah, probably. Um, and Anjali, if you want to come off mic and ask your question. Yeah, hey. Uh, so my question was basically, how do you decide between um, which kind of therapy the, they need? So let's say like chemo versus radiation versus lumpectomy or like a combination. Like how do you make those judgments? Um, so in regards to surgery, the... If we can do a simple lumpectomy, and most of the time we can, because most of these women are diagnosed through screening programs, which means we're doing mammograms before they're symptomatic. For those patients, most of the time we can do a simple lumpectomy because we can remove the cancer safely with good margins and leave behind a breast which is normal, which is normal in shape, which is symmetrical. Most of the time women are served perfectly well with the lumpectomy and with radiation. When we're doing a lumpectomy, radiation is the standard of care because we've got trials which demonstrate that we have to give radiation to reduce the risk of breast cancer returning in that breast. So radiation is part of the parcel when we do a lumpectomy. If a woman has a cancer that is a size such that if we were to remove it, we could not restore a breast which looked normal then that's an indication for a mastectomy. Using oncoplastic techniques, now we can push those boundaries. So most of the time, the women for whom we're doing all this big reduction work and all this mini flat work, they would have had a mastectomy. Now we can keep their breasts by reshaping, um, using volume replacement or volume displacement. Chemotherapy is... Uh, there are patients for whom chemotherapy is predictable based on their tumor biology. Um, and that would be, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to say it, but I don't expect you know it, triple negative breast cancers, HER2 positive breast cancers. So really, we, we, when we're looking at the pathology of breast cancer, we're looking at the hormones and the receptors they express and whether or not they're going to be receptive to certain immunotherapies and chemotherapies. So there are certain cancers which are predictable for their response to chemotherapy. The goal is always to, to try to, risk, to give them a cure. Most of the time women will achieve cure with, um, with the surgery, with radiotherapy and with, with tablets, hormonal manipulation, which they take for five years. But there is a proportion of women who require the full Monty. So they require the surgery, the chemotherapy and the, and the radiotherapy. Thank you. Thank you for such a thorough answer. And thank you, Anjali, for your question. Um, Emily, if you want to ask your question. Hi. Uh, so I'm just wondering, like, what programs or clubs or extracurriculars did you do in high school or elementary or even university to help prepare you for medical school and for the medical field? What clubs? What? Sorry, coming again. Extracurriculars. You know, Ryan kind of asked me if I had any plans to do medicine, but I kind of fell into it. I, I, um, you know, I, I did high school in, in Samoa and I was, I played a lot of sport and I played um, representative sport and I traveled a lot with it. And uh, then I got a scholarship to do medicine. And um, so that's how I fell into medicine. So you know, I just, I, I can't say that I, that I 
that I did any clubs or to, to get to get ready for I'm sorry okay your experience is your experience thanks Emmy for your question um another question we had from the chat was oh I think, um you mentioned that part of breast con surgery um is also making sure that the breast has the same sensations as before um can you explain a little bit more about what sen what sensations are um and how do you test for that um, so I, I, I literally mean the sensation of the breast. When we do a mastectomy and we put an implant under it, women lose sensation in the breast skin. So um, the skin is cold. Um, you know, I have patients who say somebody brushed against their breast in the supermarket and they didn't realize that they just realized that somebody had pushed against them. So you lose the sensation of your skin when we're doing a mastectomy because the sensation comes through the gland. And in removing the and removing the gland, we remove the cutaneous nerves to that skin, and the skin is insensate or relatively insensate. And often, when I tell a woman she'll lose her sensation, she thinks it's not a big deal. But then she gets the other side of it, and and she realizes that it is a big deal because there's a lot of um, sexual satisfaction associated with it. And um, you know, even for women going to the supermarket, this is a, she doesn't feel confident if she's if she's not able to um, to have that sensation that she she's accustomed to. So that's what that's what I mean. When we're doing simple lumpectomy surgery, then we restore we're keeping that sensation intact. Thank you. Um, we can go ahead and ask one more question before we wrap up. Um, so when some people were wondering, um, do you, is there any other complications that may impact your, like other medical complications that may impact your ability to perform surgery? And are women, um, is it suggested that they go on, undergo psychological screening before breast surgery is um, recommended? And, and do you have any other just like comments or anything you wanna leave us with today? Okay, so I got the psychological uh, involvement bit, and I definitely, um, I definitely think that's important. It's not, it's not mandatory. Certainly, it's not set up the way it is for other tumor streams or other surgical streams, but it definitely should be. Um, uh, I suppose there are centers that have that incorporated that into that have incorporated that into their treatment pathways, which which would be which would be a great thing, but. It's not, it's not standard, certainly. Um, what was the first question? Oh, it was just if there are other, like, other um, outside medical complications that may impact on a woman's ability to have uh, either a lumpectomy or a mastectomy that might complicate that in which you might have to rely on chemotherapy exclusively. If there are medical complications that preclude a woman from having surgery, then probably they're going to preclude her from having chemotherapy, I think. And um, because of course you have to be fit and well to have chemotherapy. Um, but it is a consideration um, for a woman who requires chemotherapy. So if a woman has very large cancer and I know at the time that she's gonna need chemotherapy, and I also know that she's gonna need a mastectomy and a reconstruction, then I would offer her chemotherapy up front because whenever we're doing major surgery, in particular reconstruction, there's a risk of complication. And if she has a complication, that's gonna delay her to getting to chemotherapy. So those are the considerations we would take into account when we're deciding upon sequencing of treatment. Can we give her chemotherapy first so that we have the time to give her a good reconstruction at the end of it, you know, safely without, without the risk of, without the risk of the complication having detrimental effects on her proceeding and her treatment pathway. Does that make sense? Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, do you have any final advice or anything you'd like to leave us with today? No, just that I'm uh, very happy to have um, had the opportunity to speak with you. I think it's super important. I think certainly I didn't have any idea what the path would look like when I started on it. I had no idea. Um, I think it's a very useful um, tool to have this. So bravo to Nina and the team and to you all for joining. And I'm super happy to be contacted if I can be of help in the future. Thank you so much. I, I got a lot from your session today personally, cool. and I think everyone here enjoyed it very much. So cool. thank you again for spending your time with us. And so for our students today, I'm just going to go ahead and share a quick wrap up presentation. and. 
so we can get started on the post-scattering assessment. So let's reflect a little bit today so we can think about what brought us to the session. Um, what are three major takeaways you got from the presentation and what do you want to learn more about? These aren't uh, by any means required. You don't have to submit anything, but we think it's important to kind of think about what brought us here and why we're all sharing this journey together. If you are interested in sharing your writing, you can, you can um, submit at www.preelshadowing.com slash blog submissions, and you can have the chance to get published on our website. This is great for CVs, applications, and or just something to post on your LinkedIn. If you are interested in being a part of Treehouse Shadowing, you are more than welcome to join our team as a volunteer or a team member. Um, team members have leadership positions and work with a ton of people internationally to help progress our program. If we understand we are all Treehouse students here today, and if you don't have the time to commit to that, you're always welcome to sign up to be a volunteer and work on asynchronous tasks to earn volunteer hours. So as we've stated before, Prio Shadowing is a nonprofit student-led organization and it is entirely running on the hard work of volunteers right now. If you have the capacity to donate, we invite you to please scan this QR code and just donate $1, $2, $5, whatever you can to help keep our program going. We understand that that's not always viable for everybody. So we request that if you can, please just share this link with anyone who you think might be able to help us out. So now for the time that we've all been waiting for, it's, we're going to earn our post-shadowing certificate. So first thing you're going to do is find Dr. Meredith's page on prehealthshadowing.com and sign up for the course for free. Then you can go ahead and take our 30-minute timed assessment. It's 10 questions, all multiple choice. You have two attempts to get 70% or higher in order to earn your certificate. After you're done, you can go ahead and click finish course and download your certificate. If you have any questions, please just ask our team. So if you did happen to miss part of the session today or are unable to take the quiz right after, you can go back and find the recording of our session on our YouTube channel or via our website under Dr. Meredith's page. And be sure to follow us on our social media and sign up for emails in order to catch our weekday sessions every day until June. We have the had the awesome opportunity to reach out to so many different professionals who are going to be dedicating their time to talking to students and giving their insights. So if, even if you can't make every session, it's such a great opportunity and you should be taking advantage of this, okay? We're gonna have COs, MDs, PAs, nurses, PhD holders, the whole range of professionals. So please come and join us. Okay, that is all we have for now. And so if you have any questions, please feel free to stick around. Me and some of the other team members will be here and we can answer that. Thank you again, Dr. Meredith, for your presentation. And I hope you all have a great day. Thank you, everybody. And Bye. We Bye. Thank you, Dr. Meredith. We are really quickly Thank going you. to announce the winner of the mentorship raffle today. Uh, so congratulations to Orizia L. You are the winner of today's mentorship raffle. If you could please send your email to me via um, direct message on Zoom, uh, we can send you the RSVP link. Congratulations. If you did submit a raffle ticket and you did not win this time, we do have scholarship opportunities where if you win a scholarship, you have guaranteed a admittance to this event. You can check out details on our Instagram at prehealthshadowing.com. Oops, excuse me, at prehealthshadowing. Um, but you can check out our website, which is prehealthshadowing.com. Um, feel free, uh, if anybody has any questions, like Aster said at this time, uh, members of our student team will be sticking around.